Have you ever wondered how to play the big clarinet solo in Rhapsody in Blue? If so, you're in the right place. I'm John Kurakawa, and today we're going to break down this wonderful solo with some exercises and a practical approach to playing this solo in context. I'm going to take a different approach to this one. I see a lot of people on YouTube playing this for their iPhones, including myself, and many play it very well. Everyone focuses on the opening glissando or portamento, but what about after that? When you play this in the orchestra, there's several things you have to take into account. After you nail the opening portamento, it's not a free-for-all. You have to play with good internal rhythm, but also you have to follow the conductor. So I'm going to address the glissando at the end of the video. First, let's start with the high C. If you're so fortunate to play for a good conductor like I do, they'll meet you on the high C. Once you get there, the clock is ticking. You can't engage in some sort of syrupy rhythm and do whatever you want. Everything you do for the most part needs to be fairly rhythmic, even if it does say con licenza or with license. Take this with a grain of salt. There are places where you have some freedom, but I'll point out where those are. One of my favorite orchestral musicians, Randy Bowman, principal flute of the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra, has said that when you're trying to be expressive, changing the rhythm should be the last resort. Not a bad piece of advice here. So I would highly recommend practicing the majority of this solo with a metronome, just like any other. That doesn't mean you have to play like a machine. Robert Marcellus used to talk about a metronomic rubato, which meant that you could play around inside the beats, but still line up on the primary beats. So let's break it down. I would recommend a light vibrato on the high C. That vibrato often shows the conductor that you've reached that note and you're ready to go on. So how do you do vibrato on the clarinet? There are two ways, intensity vibrato and jaw vibrato. Intensity vibrato is a variation in airspeed and jaw vibrato uses, well, the jaw. The action is kind of like chewing gum. Personally, when I use vibrato on the rare occasions I do, I like to use the jaw. The two things to consider are the speed at which the jaw moves and the amount the jaw moves. To get a feel for it, try this exercise. Hold an open G with good air speed and breath support and try doing a measured vibrato in quarter notes. Then eighth notes. Then triplets. Then sixteenths. After doing this for a while, you'll hopefully find a speed and depth to the vibrato that feels natural to you. You probably don't want to sound metronomic, but natural. It takes a while to get used to this. In measure three, I like to insert an F-sharp grace note at the beginning of the bar before the G. My teacher, Ron DeCant, did this, and I think it's a nice touch. And don't forget the accents. A little nudge on these notes brings out the jazzy syncopation throughout this passage. In measure four, I like to put a deep scoop on the last G of the measure. I use almost all of my fingers and voicing to drop the pitch on this note. How do you voice a 20 cent drop in pitch? Try this exercise I learned from Richie Holly, professor of clarinet at the Rice Shepherd School of Music. Put your hand on your throat and make a donkey sound. eee What do you feel? You should feel your throat open up a lot and your tongue drop on the yaw. Now do it in reverse. You'll feel the same thing in reverse. yaw This is the muscle you have to control. Try it by overblowing an open G to a high D and controlling it downwards and upwards. So with a combination of e i and the fingers, that's how you drop the G. Remember, we're not actually vocalizing through the clarinet, but altering our voicing as if we were saying those syllables. In measure six, don't forget the accents on the A's. I like to nudge these rather than hit them really hard. Also, I'd recommend using the side trill key for these. Do the same in measure eight. 
A little vibrato on the long notes can do a lot to sweeten these up a bit. I also like to add a short dip at the beginning of the F, similar to what I do on the G in measure four by altering my voicing and dropping and raising my tongue position. I think E, E. Now in measure 10, some people like to scoop up to the high F. Personally, I don't, and that's because of my teacher, Ron DeCant. He always felt that if you slid into the high F, it sounded like you weren't prepared for it. So I like to approach it as an octave slur. A half hole can be very helpful here in the left hand first finger, and also the banana key in your right hand if that note is flat, as it is on many Buffet R13s. Don't forget to keep your finger on the back part of the banana key. If you press down the right hand rings, you'll be even flatter than if you hadn't vented anything at all. Coming out of measure 10, it's okay to be a bit free. Be intentional on the last triplet of the measure so the conductor can catch you on the downbeat. In the last measure right before rehearsal two, make an expressive trill, then wait for the conductor to give an upbeat. This will give you plenty of time to move quickly up to the high B flat and turn things over to the trumpet. This is usually done as a regular scale, so there's no slide here. Also note that most people will usually start the scale on an E rather than the printed F. Now for the moment everyone always wants to know, how do you do the glissando at the beginning? Here are some tips. Tip one, plan out the scale leading up to the glissando. Make the trill expressive, starting slowly and softly, then speeding up the trill with a gradual crescendo. Most people start the scale from a low F sharp after the trill as opposed to the written G. I then proceed as written until I hit B natural on the staff, then I do a chromatic scale up to D. From there, the glissando begins. Here it is in slow motion. Tip number two, don't be a hero. My teacher Ron DeCant always told me this when playing Rhapsody in Blue. Mr. DeCant was for many years principal clarinetist of the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra, and while I marveled at his ability to play all the symphonic repertoire we studied from memory, he admitted to me that safety was his primary concern in the opening. You don't have to do a seven minute slide in the opening. If you can, great. I personally try to keep it shorter. There's less of a chance of things going wrong, and because I am most definitely not a jazz player, this is better for me. With this opening, you either do it or you don't. So keep the pacing in the opening comfortable for you. Tip number three, don't use a soft read. This is a tip I gleaned from Richie Holly when I played this solo in a masterclass for him when I was a grad student and he was principal clarinet of the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. This might seem counterintuitive, but I believe he's correct. A lot of people use a softer read because they think it will give them more flexibility to do the slide. They may be right. However, in my experience, the slide at the beginning requires you to use your throat, voicing, and tongue position to deviate from normal. That means a stable read will give you a normal to deviate from. Additionally, a read that is softer than what you're used to can close up when altering your voicing and embouchure. It can just shut down. Use a read that falls in your normal strength or what you'd look for in any good read. Tip number four, don't rely entirely on your fingers. Master the donkey sound exercise e on an overblown open G. Try to see how low you can go before it cracks down to a G and then back up. These are the muscles you have to learn how to control. When you get really good at this exercise, you don't have to be as precise with your fingers because the majority of the slide is happening in your throat, oral cavity, and tongue position. Tip number five, work on the pacing of your fingers. Honestly, my fingers are lifted almost completely before the glissando is complete. I do the rest with my voicing and tongue position. I find this much easier than trying to sync my fingers up perfectly. Tip number six, experiment. The name of the game is experimentation. Have fun when you're practicing this solo. It can reveal a lot about your voicing 
and tongue position. And even if you never get to play it in the orchestra, I hope it gives you some insight as to what is going on inside your mouth when playing the clarinet and how it affects response, pitch, and tone. Here it is from beginning to end. We're closing in on 2,000 subscribers, so if you haven't yet, please hit that subscribe button. In the meantime, have fun practicing this one, check out another video over here, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.